Hello and welcome to the second half of the chapter one lecture. So the first lecture we talked more about what is compliance, what is error resistance, and sort of how do we measure it. Uh, but when we start looking at both compliance and resistance together, that's where things can get a little complex. So we're going to break that down. And the big thing here is trying to look at when we see patients with different uh, issues together, what happens with their compliance, what happens with raw, with both of them together, how does that impact how we run the mechanical ventilator? And so when we're going into this, I want you to sort of just relax, try to absorb it and pause as you need. So our second half of the learning objectives, we're going to look at abnormal compliance and airway resistance issues, and we're going to try to see how fast or uh, how slow lungs will fill or empty. And that's going to be a big thing when we start talking about uh, inspiratory to expiratory ratios. And remember, a normal spontaneous breathing inspiratory to expiratory ratio is one to two. So for every one unit of inhalation, you'll spend two units of exhalation. And so when we're looking at time constants, which is seeing how long it takes to empty or fill the lungs, this is where we're going to get into where we set respiratory rates, how fast we make the breath go in, uh, how long we let the let the breath come out, especially if we have patients with different pulmonary conditions. And not every lung unit's the same. Even within your own lungs, you have different areas that have higher compliance and different areas that have lower compliance. You have smaller radius areas in your lungs for uh, conducting zone than in other ones that are a little bit larger conducting zone areas. So that's going to change how fast and how uh, slow lungs will fill and lungs will empty uh, even within your own lungs. There's different areas that are going to fill and empty faster than our others, right? And so that's where we're going to have to look at distribution of ventilation. And that's going to be an important thing when we start talking about allowing optimal surface area for oxygenation as well as optimal surface area and ventilation, right? And so that's going to allow for us to be more effective with our mechanical ventilator. Uh, the other things that we're going to look at is different co time constants. That's going to be something I have an example in here for us to go through. And we're going to look at how they affect volume distribution during not only inhalation, but also we'll talk about uh, filling and emptying for how long it takes for most lungs in general, approximately, to fill or empty uh, in general. Right, And then we're going to look at the operation also of negative pressure ventilation, positive pressure ventilation, and touch on high frequency ventilation very briefly. Do you understand high frequency ventilation is usually more traditionally used as the recording of this in the neonate pediatric context? Uh, and so that's something that you'll probably see more and experience more in that context as of recording this video. The last one here is we're going to look at baseline pressure, peak pressure, uh, what's something called PEEP or positive end expiratory pressure, plateau pressure. So there's a lot of different things here. And then measuring plateau pressure, we did talk about this a little bit in the previous video, but measuring plateau pressure is going to be part of what we're going to see here. And you'll see that being an experience that we need to do at the bedside as well if we're going to look at what is happening with this patient's compliance. All right, so the first section here we have is the time constant. So the big thing, we have regional differences of compliance and resistance that exist throughout our lungs. That includes, hey, my apices are traditionally going to be more patent and more open. And so I'm going to have a lower compliance because Hooke's Law says that as a balloon is about ready to be completely full, the surface of the balloon is very tight, right? So is it going to accept a lot of volume if the balloon's about ready to pop? No. So the compliance of that balloon is going to be low. So in my apices, I'm going to have lower compliance than in my bases where there's more weight, there's more mass, there's more blood flow, and so I'm going to have higher compliance there. So that's going to affect the filling and emptying of my lungs too, just that regional difference between my apices and my bases. 
And then we're not only that, but we have different radius of the airways, right? So we're going to have smaller conducting zones uh, in different parts of the lung. Uh, when we start getting to smaller and smaller and smaller airways, as we start going to transition zone, that's when we start to see different RAWs for different lung units, right? And so that's going to affect how long it takes to empty or fill even different parts of the lung. So different parts of the lungs are going to fill faster than others and empty faster than others. And that's going to be important to realize if we want to make sure we have adequate gas exchange on our patients, at least survivable gas exchange on our patients in some cases. So compliance and resistance are the ones that we want to look at here. And both of those together, the product of compliance and resistance is what's called the time constant. So when we're looking at the time constant, that's how long it takes for the lung units to empty or to fill, right? The length of time it takes to fill or empty the lungs, right? This is the product. So it's lung compliance times airway resistance. So that's something that you need to remember. Uh, we do calculate this, especially when we're looking at advanced modes like APRV, uh, which we'll get into down the road. We want to see, okay, if we're not using any end expiratory pressure on a patient and we want them to exhale but not fully, uh, we need to make sure that they're not exhaling completely so that way they don't collapse their lungs and cause atelectasis and possibly atelect trauma or shearing trauma. So those are things that we're going to look at here. So time constants is going to be valuable not only for expiratory, but for inspiratory as well. If we have different lung units, different compliance for all those areas, we need to go in there and see uh, how long it's going to take to pretty much fill up most of the lung units and get them filled. So that way we have adequate delivery of gas so that way we could ventilate we can get good co2 and o2 exchange ultimately as well so that uh, external respiration occurs right bringing it back to that first lecture uh, time constants always equals the length of time in seconds required for the lung to inflate or deflate a certain percentage and we're going to go into those percentages in detail here the other things that we'll see is how fast uh, the lung units will empty or fill. And so when we're looking at this, the lung units are going to be, uh, some will fill faster and empty faster, some will not. So when we're looking at this clinically, Compliance and airway resistance reflect a patient's overall lung function. So that's something to think about when we ta start talking about restrictive versus obstructive patterns or even combined patterns that can be going on with our patient, right? So we need to recognize that when we see a patient with an obstructive pattern, that it's going to take a lot longer for the lung units to fill and a lot longer for the lung units to empty. When we see a patient with a restrictive pattern or very small, uh, a very small lung unit, right, very restricted uh, space for the lung tissue, it's going to be very quick to fill that up because it's a very small container. It's going to be very quick to empty because it's a very small container. So this will help us guide treatment decisions as we're looking at do these lung units have, are they a fast few lung, lung units with this patient's current disease process or are they more slow lung units with this patient? current disease process. So fast lung units, if we're looking at here, this is the first one here. We have short time constants and take less time to empty or fill. And these are going to be usually your smaller or restrictive disease processes. So anything that restricts the lungs from expanding. It could be a chest wall, an abdomen thing. It could be a pleural fusion. It could be a pneumothorax. It could be a third trimester of pregnancy, right? Anything that restricts kyphoscoliosis, they're going to have that shorter time constants, pneumo, uh, pneumo, pneumonia as well, can easily do this. So anything that restricts the ability for the lungs to expand, right? Short time constants are associated with normal or low airway resistance, right? And decreased compliance, right? Well, the smaller the lung unit, the lower the, the compliance, the, the more that tissue is not willing to expand. If it's not willing to expand, by definition, that's low compliance. It's not being compliant with moving, right? And so anything that decreases not only the chest wall, thoracic, abdomen compliance, but also the tissue itself, like a pneumonia where there's inflammation of your respiratory zone, that's going to resist 
the movement of expanding and so therefore it has low compliance so usually we're looking at a low compliance situation right pulmonary fibrosis is a big example here and that's what we see here with this point that pulmonary fibrosis so it's something you want to pay attention to what disease pattern does my patient currently have and what does that mean for mechanical ventilation what does that mean for how fast or how uh, slow the lungs will fill and empty right and that's going to help you ultimately uh, make better decisions on time on doing inspiratory times doing expiratory times and looking at your ventilation strategies slower young lung units as we're looking at here have a long time constant they require more time to fill and more time to empty right compared with your normal or fast lung units right they usually have increased resistance so this one think obstructive disease and then this one up here think restrictive right so if we are fast lung units you're usually thinking of a restrictive disease process with your slow lung units you're usually thinking an obstructive process and this can include uh, a lot of secretions this can include inflammation and swelling this can include floppy airways like you see with emphysema right this can include anything that's an obstructive condition chronic bronchitis bronchiectasis emphysema right your copd ears right this is one of your classic cases where you have someone with an obstructive condition it's going to take a lot longer for that breath to be delivered and a lot longer for for them to exhale right it's going to be one of those things where it's blocking the speed of the gas coming in it's blocking the speed of the gas coming out that's why in pft world their flow rates are decreased right how fast can that gas in how fast can that gas get out right it's going to be very slow to come out that's why they have low flow rates and so therefore when you put them on a ventilator can you do a really fast respiratory rate with these patients and expect them to exhale fully probably not right they're probably going to have gas that gets stuck in their lungs because they're not fully exhaling because their lung units right now are slow because they have an obstructive disease pattern so when you think slow lung units think obstructive high airway resistance units and then an example of this is your pulmonary emphysema right that's going to be one of your primary examples they have loose floppy airways they lost their elastins their compliance and this one is really high right so they have high compliance low elastins we talked about that in the previous lecture and therefore when they exhale they don't have the elasticity force to force it back in they just have that slow sustained exhalation so when we're looking at this that's something to consider we're going to have regional differences in compliance and resistance throughout the whole lungs. This is the resistance is what we're going to look at with the respiratory zone, right? With the respiratory zone is going to be your big one uh, that we're going to be looking at. And here I have a little of example of what I'm looking at overall. But before we get to this picture example, I like this picture example. Uh, the characteristics of the different parts of the lung units, we just talked about this. The apices and the bases, they're going to have different filling, different speeds of filling, different speeds of exiting. So the, the characteristics of the lungs are heterogeneous, not homogeneous. Not all of them will move at the same speed. Not all of them will exit at the same speed, right? It's going to be different throughout the different regions of the lungs, right? So some lung units might have normal compliance, normal resistance characteristics, where others may have physiological changes where they have an increased resistance, right? A smaller radius in this one uh, terminal respiratory zone right or decreased compliance in this one area like we talked about with the APC staying open most of the time so alterations and compliance and area resistance really affect how the lung units fill and empty each small unit is like an, an inflatable balloon attached to a straw the balloon uh, when we're looking at this I did a picture here of a bucket and a hose right and the, imagine the bucket here as your respiratory zone or your your lung units that stretch and or stay small right and or normal so we're looking at the different lung units here number one here on the side this is the one that we're looking at here i have a compliance that's increased so a compliance that increase means i have normal ability to get oxygen and air into and out of my lungs and that's the hose 
I have the normal ability to get oxygen and air into and out. But my bucket, my respiratory zone, stretched out. I have a really big respiratory zone. I have a really big stretched out floppy bucket that it goes into. So because it's such a big bucket, because it's such a big respiratory zone, it's going to take a long time for this little garden hose to fill up that big bucket, right? And so that's going to be an increased compliance. So an example of that would be hyperinflation without airway resistance, right? So that's going to be something, if I were just to tell you someone's compliance increased, what if I give you a scenario where someone had a cardiac surgery and they didn't sew the sternum together? Well, if they did that, then the lungs can expand, but there's no resistance of the rib cage to block them from expanding. So now my thoracic compliance has increased, or I broke a bunch of ribs. My thoracic compliance has increased. So what's going to happen with the time it takes to inflate the lungs? What's going to happen with the time it takes for the lungs to empty, right? It's going to be a lot longer time it takes for the lungs to empty or fill. The next one, number two over here, now I'm going to have the opposite scenario. Now I have something that just decreases my lung compliance. So there's no change in the hose. The hose is still flowing at the same flow rate. So our conducting zone, staying the same, right? There's no obstruction in our conducting zone. So now we just have a restrictive process, right? Think about this one as a pneumonia, a pulmonary fibrosis, if you will, something that restricts the lung units. Pleural fusion, something that's restricting the lungs from expanding. So here, is it gonna take a long time to fill up this tiny little bucket with that hose? Well, no, right? It's not gonna take that long at all. So what about emptying that bucket? Well, it's a tiny bucket it's going to be pretty easy to empty, right? It's not going to take very long to empty. So when we look at just changes in compliance, if I have a high compliance, like broken ribs, uh, sternum that hasn't been sewed back together, right? Anything like that that increases compliance, it's going to take a long time for it to fill and a long time for it to empty. If my compliance decreases, however, if I have a restrictive effect, whether it's thoracic, abdominal, uh, muscle skeletal, or I have uh, a tissue issue like pulmonary fibrosis or pneumonia that kicks in, the volume of that container decreases. Therefore, the time it takes to fill a tinier container decreases and the time it takes to empty it also decreases. All right, let's move on to the next one, number three over here. Number three, this is where we're now looking at what airway resistance does to this factor. So here I have a normal size bucket. This bucket, perfectly normal, right? And so when we're looking at this bucket, now am I going to have as much water in this hose flowing out the end of it when it's kinked like that? Well, of course not. You're like, Derek, yeah, that's not going to flow into that bucket very easily. It's kinked, right? What happens to the water flow off the output? right, goes down. So my ability to get water into that normal size bucket is decreased. What if I had a tumor in my trachea? What happens to the ability for air to flow in? It's going to be obstructed, right? I have something obstructing the flow of gas going into my normal lung. So what happens with the amount of time it takes for me to get gas and fill my lung units? Or what happens to the amount of time it takes for me to exhale and get empty my lung units? right? That's going to be a longer time constant. So what we see here is that an increase in airway resistance makes a longer time constant. So if I have emphysema where I have floppy tissue, right? If I have floppy tissue and it collapses prematurely or I have an asthma uh, situation where I have swollen and smaller radius airways, if I have anything that narrows down and creates a smaller radius of my airways, especially my uh, conducting zone that's non-cartilaginous, we're looking at transition zone traditionally here, then that's really going to increase my time constant. I'm going to need to make sure that patient has a long time to exhale for sure, a long time to exhale. So that way we don't trap any gas in there. All right, let's go to number four here. Number four is your classic one. Now I'm giving you a scenario where your airway resistance is increased because the hose is kinked, right? Something's obstructing the flow and you have a big bucket at the same time. This bucket is significantly bigger than that one. So when we're looking at this one, and not only do I have a bigger bucket, so I have a stretched out lung unit, this is a good case of emphysema, right? So I'm going to have a big bucket, stretched out bucket, which in baseline, it's going to take a long time to fill. 
baseline. Going to take a long time to empty. Now I add in obstructive airways. Now I add floppy airways to this. This is emphysema, right, where we add those floppy airways to it. Now we got a case where it's going to take a lot longer than just a big bucket, right? Not only do we have a big bucket, but now we've got the airway resistance to add on to it. So now I have to really make sure this patient might need a 1 to 4, 1 to 5 IE ratio just to get the breath out so they don't trap gas in their lungs. So think about that pathophysiology. That's one of the reasons when we go in to see a patient, we look at their airway resistance, we look at their compliance, because we want to see where it's trending. Is it getting better, getting worse? And if it's the compliance is getting worse, then we know that they have a shorter time constant. We know we can set a faster rate without air trapping. Hey, their, their air trapping is getting worse on this COPD patient. Hey, I need to make sure they have a longer expiratory time, so I'm going to decrease the rate. I'm going to increase the speed of the gas delivery so that way they have a longer time to exhale, right? So we're going to try to accommodate for that patient condition to make sure that they have the right uh, ability to empty their lungs or to fill their lungs so we can optimize oxygenation and ventilation. Right? So we're going to see a lot of physiological changes, not only in normal lung process, but we're also going to see a lot of physiological changes in regional changes uh, with disease process. So that's something to make sure that you're looking at. Now consider, okay, what does this do to my thoracic pressures? If it takes me a long time to exhale, I have a lot of pressure in my chest wall a lot longer than it should be. What does that do to my vena cava? What does that do to my blood flow back to my right atrium? Right, So there are those cardiac and hemodynamic, and not only that, but uh, intracranial pressures. Right, If I have a lot of thoracic pressure, what happens to my superior vena cava? What happens to my intracranial pressure as well? So these are all things to think about in general physiology uh, as you guys are starting to learn this. All right, so now we're going to get into some numbers, so don't don't shut your brain off right now, right? We're not doing the math right now. So that's not a thing to be aversion to here. So after five time constants, the lung is considered to contain 100% of its tidal volume if breath is being delivered, or 100% of its tidal volume has been exhaled. We're not talking total lung capacity. We're not talking vital capacity. We're just talking tidal volume here just tidal volume, which is 10% of your total lung capacity. So after five time constants, you're considered to have 100% of that breath being delivered to your lung units, or after five expiratory time constants, you should have 100% of that tidal volume that's been exhaled, right? So when we're looking at a lung unit, we're looking at how long it takes for it to empty or fill. So if we do the, the time constant calculation, if we do it, so we just take compliance times resistance, and both of them got to be in liters, right? So uh, compliance times resistance, uh, when we're looking at this, it's going to give us one time constant. Then I'm going to take that value and multiply it by five, or five of those, right? So five of those time constants would be 100% of the tidal volume being delivered or 100% of the tidal volume being exhaled. So once we usually get to around three time constants, which is what you see here, right? This 95% of the tidal volume has been delivered. 95% of the tidal volume has been exhaled. So we see a significant difference between three time constants and two time constants. So anything less than three time constants is going to be trapping gas in the lung units, right? And we're going to call this auto peep, sneaky peep, occult peep. There's a lot of synonyms for it, but we're going to see that trapping of gas uh, with anything less than three time constants. So it's an important landmark when we're looking at things like APRV ventilation down the road where we might be using time constants to purposely trap gas, right? And that's something we'll talk about later on. But traditionally, it, anything less than three time constants is going to lead to a lot of air trapping. When you have four to five time constants, there's usually a lot less chance of air trapping, right? And so we're, we're talking about not total lung capacity, just tidal volume.
So when we're setting a patient's inspiratory time on a ventilator, how long is it going to take for that breath to be delivered, right? When we're setting an inspiratory time on a breathing machine, uh, we can even do different modes where we set an expiratory time. The inspiratory time less than three time constants may result in an incomplete delivery of tidal volume. All right, what's the, what, what's, what's the big deal, Derek, if we're not delivering 100% of the tidal volume? Well, what happens to your ability to ventilate? What happens to your ability to exchange gas, that external respiration, right? You're going to sacrifice that if you do not have at least three plus time constants, right? So an inspiratory time less than three time constants may result in incomplete delivery of the tidal volume, right? So you're gonna have a lot of stuff staying in your conducting zone that's not gonna make its way to exchanging gas with the capillaries at the alveolar capillary level. So if I prolong an inspiratory time, this allows for a lot more even distribution of ventilation and adequate delivery of tidal volume. So this is where I might want a slightly longer inspiratory time, right? So that's gonna help me in lung units that are especially slower. Right? I might need to have a longer inspiratory time with slower lung units. Right, So five time constants should be considered for the inspiratory time, especially in pressure targeted ventilation. There's traditionally two ways to set up uh, a ventilator when we're delivering a breath to a patient. Uh, when we're doing positive pressure ventilation, we can either set up to deliver a certain amount of pressure over a certain time length. Hey, I'm going to deliver 20 centimeters of water pressure for one second or 1.2 seconds, right? So I can do a pressure setting or I can do a volume setting where I say, hey, I'm going to give you 500 milliliters and I'm going to target an inspiratory time of around one second. And I'm going to adjust that by flow rate, things like that. So there's two general ways to deliver that breath, and that's what we'll be looking at here. So we're going to try to aim for five time constants uh, to try to make sure we have ad adequate volume delivery. And we'll talk about more of this in chapter two, especially with pressure ventilation. Uh, but it is important to recognize that if inspiratory time is too long, right, you're like, well, what's the da danger of me going longer? Well, then the respiratory rate might be a little too slow to get good minute ventilation. Remember, the calculation for minute ventilation is respiratory rate times tidal volume, right? And if our respiratory rate is slow, even though we have adequate tidal volume delivery, what happens to our ability to exchange CO2 and O2? It, it goes down pretty significantly. So an expiratory time less than three time constants may lead to inadequate emptying of the lungs. We talked about that with auto peep. This can increase FRC, right? This can air trap the patient and cause air to stay in the lungs. And so that could easily lead to eventually causing hyperinflation to get worse and even lead to things like a pneumothorax. So we gotta be very careful with expiratory time constants as well as inspiratory time constants. Right? So exact time settings require careful observation. They're, the ventilator's not as good at this as we are, right? There's a reason why we're part of the assessment thing. We gotta look at this stuff. We gotta evaluate this stuff at the bedside. This is that practitioner side of you that needs to be developed. So we need to observe the patient and look at their end expiratory pressure or how much pressure is left over after the breath has been uh, exhaled to determine uh, what time is going to be best for this patient, what inspiratory time, what expiratory times are going to be optimal for this patient. So this is part of your assessment. Is the patient getting 100% of their tidal volume inhaled? Is the patient exhaling close to 100% of their tidal volume? That's part of your patient assessment, and you should be able to see these trends. So we'll work on these skills in the lab. Right. Short time constants are associated with normal or low airway resistance uh, and low compliance. So this is like your, nor uh, your pneumonia patients, right? Or your restrictive lung disease patterns, right? So that's, those are the ones that it's, they're not going to need a long inspiratory time. They're not going to need a long expiratory time. And they'll still get 100% of that tidal volume delivered and 100% of it will be exhaled. However, Lung units that are short time constants, right, those low compliance ones, usually need a lot more pressure to achieve a normal volume. So because the compliance is small, because they're so restricted, it's going to take a lot more pressure to expand those, and that's the trade-off, right? And we don't want to have things like pressure trauma to the lungs. They're very sensitive things.
So slow long units, in contrast, have a long time constants, which require more time to fill, more time to empty, right? Slow units usually have an increase in airway resistance, right? So we'll check the raw on the, on the ventilator uh, and we'll calculate it. So both are typically found with increased raw and increased compliance uh, with patients with emphysema, right? And that's something to pay attention to, especially when we look at that patient population, patients with COPD, patients with emphysema tend to get a lot of infections and end up needing ventilatory support. Not all of them, but when we see that, that's something we got to be concerned about when we put them on assisted ventilation is they're going to have slow lung units, right? So lungs are rarely uniform as far as emptying and filling across different lung units. And remember, even with emphysema, it's the apices that have the primary parts uh, of the destruction if it's uh, emphysema that's caused by smoking and if it's uh, emphysema caused by an alpha-1 antitrypsin, it's the basis, right? So th even those regional differences in emphysema, right, depending which kind of emphysema the patient has, centrolobular versus panlobular, can be play a big role in what we're looking at for the lung units filling or emptying, right? So we must recognize that there's regional differences and help us, uh, that that recogni recognizing that really helps us make the decisions that we need to move forward. So time constants, uh, one time constant, you should have these down. These are things I expect you to remember. Uh, one time constants allows for 63% of the volume to be inhaled. Uh, two time constants allow for 86% of the volume to be inhaled. So quite a bit more. And then three time constants, now we're at the 95%. Four time constants, 98%. That's a lot better for the lung, the tidal volume being delivered and or the tidal volume being exhaled, right? Five time constants, that's 100% of the breath delivery or 100% of the breath exhaled. Remember, you don't want to overshoot this either. You don't want to have someone give someone 12 time constants just because, right? Now, the emptying the alveoli after a time constant, this is a different graph. This one's not in your book, but we're looking at the expiratory side. Now, I thought it was a pretty interesting graph to show you. Here you see the time constants. Hey, I have one time constant here, two time constants here, and this is for breath delivery. But now as we exhale, we're looking at elasticity and the thoracic abdominal compliance playing a factor besides the compliance of the lung unit itself in here. And so the resistance uh, can really slow this down too, obviously, right? If I'm trying to exhale through an open mouth, it's pretty easy, pretty fast. Now, if I try to exhale through a tiny little coffee straw, right? It's going to take a lot longer to empty that gas out. And here, this is where we see the expiratory time constant. At one, I've only emptied Right, I have 37% of that breath left in. At two time constants, 35 or 15% uh, of that breath, right? And then so on and so forth. How much is left over at the end of four time constants? Only 2%. So when we're looking at doing inspiratory and expiratory time constants, it's important to recognize your percentages so that way we can help not only get good ventilation and good tidal volume delivery for the breath in, but also good elimination of CO2, good elimination of pressure out. All right, so if you need to go back and review those, we'll do a little review at the end here. Uh, but there are three basic uh, methods that have been developed to mimic or replace normal mechanisms of breathing, where you're gonna have negative pressure ventilation, positive pressure ventilation, and then high frequency ventilation. So let's talk about these individually. So negative pressure ventilation attempts to mimic the function of the respiratory muscles to allow for normal physiological mechanisms because traditionally your diaphragm contracts, moves down, your external intercostals may contract as well, and then pull the rib cage open and we're using low alveolar pressure to suction atmospheric pressure in, right? So that's gonna be a good way, a good physiologic way. Well, the other advantage of that, hey, what happens with your vena cava, right? Your inferior vena cava gets pulled open, right? Cause you have that thoracic wall suction, right? And it's gonna pull blood to your right atrium, right? We're gonna have some cardiac benefits to that as well. So negative pressure ventilation is more to mimic natural 
physiologic function. And some examples of these negative pressure ventilators here, uh, we have the iron lung that you'll see here in that top picture. Uh, this head and neck are exposed to ambient pressure, while the thorax and the rest of the body are in an airtight container uh, that's in negative pressure. So it's going to use that suction pressure of the thoracic and the body surface pressure, right, to pull in, right? So negative pressure is generated around the thoracic area is transmitted on the chest wall into the pleural space and the pleural space then transmit it to the alveolar space and then suction happens and gas blows in right and that's how that iron lung works right that's how we see this little kid here in that iron lung with negative pressure ventilators the intrapleural pressure right so this intrapleural pressure becomes negative it becomes suction right we just talked about that so the alveolar pressure becomes negative and atmospheric pressure then is more positive gas flows in remember that pressure gradient is important right uh, so they re resemble normal lung mechanics. We're going to have a much more mimic of what are normally how our lungs fill and how our lungs empty. We're not forcing anything in. We're pulling it in just like we normally would. So the elastic recoil of the lungs and the chest wall cause everything to flow out passively, also mimicking natural movement. So negative pressure ventilators do provide a lot of advantages uh, as long as the upper airway can be maintained, right? And that's a key component here, as long as that upper airway can be obtained. So negative pressures, uh, uh, ventilators, uh, they, they, they're, no, they're used without an endotracheal tube or tracheostomy tube. Usually, uh, these patients can talk and eat while they're being ventilated. Uh, a lot of uh, fewer physiological disadvantages in negative pressure ventilation. Normal cardiovascular function that we've already talked about um, compared to pulmonary uh, positive pressure ventilation. Uh, hypovolemic patients, uh, usually uh, a normal cardiovascular response is not always present. So if a person has low blood pressure to begin with, you may not see that advantage as much, right? Uh, the big thing here, as a result of that suctioning or the pulling of it, the pulling of the blood in the abdomen, uh, you're going to see reduced uh, venous uh, flow to the heart and then can complicate things like bathing and turning, right? Can you imagine bathing and turning a kid that's in an iron lung? right? It's going to be a lot harder there. Uh, skin care, uh, doing an EKG on this person, right? So a lot of negative pressure ventilators declined, uh, use declined in the 1980s. And so the, we sort of seen that trend uh, peak around the polio epidemic. So that was something that was used a long time, right? There's other methods out there. Uh, like uh, the chest caress, uh, and you'll see in that bottom picture, uh, poncho wrap, the port lung they've all been used in home care patients to treat chronic respiratory failure. So these are great, especially even for neuromuscular. So polio, uh, amniotrotic lateral sclerosis, right, ALS, right, those are all things that are options for those patients. But most of the time, they're going to be going with non-invasive ventilators that use a mask or a nasal device or even a tracheostomy tube uh, as an interface. So we see uh, some different things here, right? A lot of things that go on the negative pressure in the 1960s, uh, research found that the survival rate for invasive ventilation was higher than negative pressure ventilation. That's one of the things that spurred uh, the big movement towards more positive pressure ventilation. Positive pressure ventilation here occurs when a ventilator is used to deliver air into the lungs, uh, whether we're using an endotracheal tube, or a, a positive pressure mask, or even a tracheostomy tube. So if the pressure at the upper airway is 15 centimeters of water and the pressure at the alveoli is zero, technically that's positive pressure and we're delivering positive pressure. Air will go into the lung because there's positive pressure. With negative pressure ventilation, Air flowed into the lungs because there was less pressure in the lungs, right? We're suctioning the pressure in. Here, we have positive pressure and we're forcing it in. And that's what makes it positive pressure in the lung units. So at any point during inflating, uh, in inspiration, uh, we're going to have uh, airway resistance be something that takes a big factor because it's going to take more pressure to go through a smaller radius. And so that's something that's going to be a limiting factor with, uh, with how fast our lung units 
are able to fill or empty. So this ties back to your time constants, right? So alveolar uh, pressure, once it builds up, once we're delivering that pressure to the respiratory zone, becomes positive. Once it becomes positive, it expands. Once the alveolar pressure becomes positive and expands, what happens to the pleural pressure? right the pleural space gets smaller because the lungs are expanding as the container gets smaller the pressure inside the container increases right so we're going to have more pleural pressure so we're going to see their pleural pressure start to go up so the visceral pleura the interpleural space become positive in positive pressure ventilation i'll repeat that again the visceral pleura, the, uh, the, the space between the visceral and the parietal pleura the pleural space becomes positive in positive pressure ventilation. It is negative in negative or spontaneous breathing, right? So that's a big difference between those two. Uh, at the end of a breath delivery, at the end of inhalation, the ventilator stops delivering the positive pressure, right? Mouth pressure returns to zero, right? Because now it stopped delivering the breath. And alveolar pressure is still positive in the lungs, so what's gonna happen? Well, it creates a gradient between the alveoli and the mouth and gas will flow out of the lungs, right? So we're going to see a difference in pressure changes, especially with positive pressure ventilation. High frequency ventilation, we'll touch on it here. This is something we'll have to do a separate video about down the road. Uh, high frequency ventilation uses above normal ventilating rates and below normal tidal volume. So we're going to have an, a, a strategy out there called ARDS net ventilating strategy, and it's where we're going to use smaller tidal volumes with faster respiratory rates. The idea here is that we're not causing volume trauma, we're not expanding the lungs too deeply, and we're not causing uh, trauma or damage from hyperexpansion with very sick lung units. So when we look at uh, high frequency ventilation, we're taking that strategy of using smaller tidal volumes and faster rates, and we're advancing that idea in that theory even more to the extreme. So now we have tidal volumes less than anatomical dead space and rates significantly higher than normal respiratory rates, which will then cause the lungs to not have as much volume expansion and not as much trauma. So that's one of the advantages here. Uh, barrow trauma, volume trauma are one of those ideas here that can be avoided is the idea. Right, so high, there's different types of high frequency ventilation. There's high frequency positive pressure ventilation, which uses respiratory rates around 60 to 100, and there's sort of an example there. Uh, breaths per minute, so that's a very high respiratory rate. So that's a pretty high respiratory rate. Uh, there's the high frequency uh, jet ventilator, uh, and that's the one here, and this is the one by Benel. Uh, it uses rates between 100 and 400 and even up to 600 breaths per minute. Uh, so really, really fast respiratory rates there. So puff, 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 puff. So um, both of these, inhalation is active and exhalation is passive. And that's going to be a big thing here. And then the last one here, you'll see a tiny picture here, is the oscillator, high frequency oscillatory ventilation. So this uses rates uh, that can go into the thousands, about 4,000 breaths per minute if you want to push it. Uh, the cl in clinical practice, various types of high-frequency ventilation are better defined by the type of ventilator rather than the specific rates of each one, right? The, the oscillator has both active inhalation and active exhalation, so it pushes and pulls the breath out, pushes and pulls the breath out. Think about a speaker on a car that bounces with really high, loud-sounding music, right? So it pushes and pulls, pushes and pulls, and right, and has a drum in there that you'll see it push, pull, push, pull, push, pull, right? So we're going to see that they function mechanically a little bit differently. So that's why it's better defined by the type of ventilator used rather than the specific rates, right, uh, that are used. So high frequency positive pressure ventilation, uh, you can use a conventional ventilator that, with this instead of higher rates, but just a low, lower than normal tidal volume. Uh, jet ventilator, you're using uh, pressurized jets of gas into the lungs at very high frequencies, usually around 4 to 11 hertz or cycles per second, right? Uh, 
The jet uses a specifically designed endotracheal tube adapter or a nozzle or an injector. Uh, that smaller diameter creates a high velocity jet of air, jet of air, right, that's directed into the lungs. Exhalation is passive, right? And that's one of the big things to remember about the jet versus the oscillator. The uh, high frequency oscillator use either a small piston that we talked about earlier to move in and out or a device similar to a stereo speaker to deliver gas in and out, right? To deliver gas in and out. So that changes the physics and the movement of gas. So the gas flow in the lungs are different between the jet and different between the oscillator, right? They're, they're not identical to each other by any means. So the physics of gas moving in and moving out are different, right? If we're ventilate uh, with high frequency oscillation, usually we're using that with infants in respiratory distress uh, or uh, when we're looking at the, the jet, we're looking usually at something with open air leaks or bronchial pleural fistulas. Those can be used uh, with oscill oscillation as well. Um, but when we talk, start talking about this, we'll talk about that later uh, uh, as well. But more on your neonate pediatric patient population when we're looking at these or this mode of ventilation. So you do know the th need to know the three kinds or types, high frequency of positive pressure, high frequency jet and high frequency oscillatory ventilation. All right, moving on. During mechanical ventilation, you have proximal airway pressure that's not typically measured at the airway opening due to the secretions or uh, sensor measurements. Uh, now, there are some ones that have pretty close measurements to the airway, some proximal measurements. Uh, so you will see some different ventilators offer things like that, especially in neonate medicine as well. Uh, so current generation of ICU mechanical ventilator pressures measure airway pressure using a sensor, right? The sensor is usually in the expiratory valve of the machine, so that's typically where it is. Uh, the ventilator manometer pressure is displayed at the user interface of the ventilator. So when they exhale, it tells us how much pressure has been delivered, how much pressure they're exhaling, and that's a manometer that's measuring it, right? And it's going to give us airway pressure. So a manometer or is another way of looking at a pressure gauge, right? It's used by the ventilator to determine pressure at the, per at the current moment. So at the end of inhalation, it's giving me inspiratory pressure. At the end of exhalation, it's giving me expiratory pressure, right? So we're hopefully using proximal pressures as much as we can, especially with our very tiny patient population. Uh, if we have the technology to do it with proximal, that's even better, right? That gives us very much more accurate uh, values. So we're looking at that ventilator closely to see how much pressure is takes to deliver that breath and how much pressure is left over at the end of the breath, especially if we're concerned with things like air trapping and leaving a lot of pressure in the lungs if we don't have those five expiratory time constants. So baseline pressures. When we're looking at baseline pressure, the baseline pressure should be zero or atmospheric, right? Which indicates that no additional pressure is applied at the airway opening uh, uh, during exploration and before inspiration. So we don't have any ex extra pressure left over and then inspiration begins. So sometimes this baseline pressure can be higher than zero, like when we set a higher pressure at the end of exhalation. So I can choose to tell a ventilator, hey, instead of having zero at the end of their breath delivery, like when they exhale, instead of having zero pressure left in there, I'm going to give you uh, five centimeters of pressure. I'm going to leave in some pressure just to help keep your lung units open, right? Just to help with that, right? So I can choose to leave baseline pressure in there. I can choose to leave baseline and uh, pressure in there. This is called positive end expiratory pressure or PEEP, right? So when PEEP is set, the ventilator prevents the patient from exhaling to zero or atmospheric pressure. So the PEEP therefore increases the volume of gas remaining in the lungs at the end of a normal exhalation. Right? It increases the volume of gas remaining in the lungs at the end of a normal exhalation. Right? PEEP increases FRC. It helps maintain pulmonary capacity. It helps maintain recruitment of the respiratory zone. And that's the idea behind 
avoiding atelic trauma where the alveoli that are collapsing, those very low compliant alveoli that collapse from ripping open with each subsequent breath. So if we can help maintain their patency, that might help maintain some of that health and not only that, but help increase surface area for ventilation and avoid trauma, right? Atelic trauma. So PEEP applied by the operator, that's us, is referred to as extrinsic PEEP or auto PEEP or uh, intrinsic PEEP, which is a potential side of, auto PEEP is a, a potential side effect of positive pressure ventilation. Extrinsic PEEP, uh, extrinsic with an E, is what I said on the machine, right? So when you look at the machine and you see a PEEP uh, value there, that's extrinsic. That's what I'm putting on the machine. But when we talk about auto PEEP, that's what the patient has secondary to a condition or intrinsic PEEP is secondary to a condition, which would be a side effect like trapped gas. We didn't set a long enough expiratory time right? Uh, his air can accidentally be trapped in the lung, and then we're going to have to adjust the, uh, our ventilator to help reduce that air being trapped in the lung. So intrinsic PEEP, right, usually occurs when a patient doesn't have enough time to exhale completely before the ventilator delivers another breath. So that's where we're going to have to make sure that we do things to help reduce that, like decrease the respiratory rate or increase the speed of the breath delivery so that way they have a lot longer to exhale between the, the respiratory rate um, triggering. So there's that, or we could even, if it's something like uh, air being trapped because the airways are floppy, well, if we increase that CPAP level, that PEEP level on the ventilator, then we can stent open those airways and allow for a lot more of that gas to be exited. So we can allow for a lot more of that gas to come out. So that way less is left over at the end of the breath. So we'll have to look at that patient individual case by case. Peak airway pressure, this is the amount when the breath is delivered. So uh, during positive pressure ventilation, the manometer rises progressively to what we call the peak airway pressure, right? Uh, this is the highest pressure recorded at the end of inspiration. It's also called the peak inspiratory pressure or PIP or peak airway pressure, right? There's different terminology for this. The pressures measured during inhalation are the sum of two pressures, the pressure required to force the gas through the airways, Right, so that looks at your airway resistance and the pressure of the gas volume as it fills the alveoli or looking at your compliance, right? So if I have someone with high airway resistance and low compliance, right, I'm going to have a lot of pressure to deliver that breath. It's going to take a lot of high pressure to deliver that breath. So Derek, give me an example of this. Hey, what about a pneumothorax? What about a hole in the lung? So the lungs are super tiny. The pleural space is pushing the lungs closed. And we have a lot of resistance because what happens to the large airways, right? The radius of the airways, the conducting zone also gets smaller. So not only do we have an increased raw, we also have a decreased compliance. So it's going to take a lot of pressure to try to deliver that breath. Right, so that's going to be an example where your peak airway pressures, and in that case, also your plateau pressures, are going to be super high. So it's going to take a lot of PIP to do that. So a PIP can be a product, or it can be a result, I should say. It can be a result of a compliance decreasing, or it can be a result of airway resistance increasing, or it can be a result of both compliance decreasing and airway resistance increasing. So this means we need to evaluate the patient further to see what's going on. Is this a compliance issue? Is their compliance getting worse? Is it their airway resistance issue? Is there an airway resistance problem going on? If there, are they wheezing? Do we need to give them a nebulizer? Right. So we need to know, is this involved the alveoli or is this the conducting zone? And that's where we're going to start talking about plateau pressure. So plateau pressure is another measurement or variable that we'll look at. It's measured after the breath has been delivered, right? And before exhalation begins. So at the end of a breath, we're going to pause and check what pressure there is there. So there's no breath delivery. It's done. There's no exhalation. It hasn't started yet. And that's where we do that inspiratory pause maneuver, right? Exhalation is prevented by the ventilator for about a half second to 1.5 seconds. So anywhere between 0.5 and 1.5 seconds uh, to get this. So we usually do, it's called an inspiratory hold or an inspiratory pause, depending on the manufacturer and what terminology they choose to use. It's similar to holding the breath at end inhalation. 
and just lost, right? At that point of breath holding, the pressure inside the alveoli and the mouth are equal. So alveolar pressure and, and mouth pressure are equal. So they're at equilibrium, so there's no gas flow. So the relaxation of the respiratory muscles and the elastic recoil of the lung are exerting force on the inflated lungs, which creates pressure, which can be read on the manometer as a positive pressure value. So because this occurs, right, we're seeing a plateau value. So the plateau pressure reading will be inaccurate if the patient is breathing. So if you got someone that's breathing really fast, let's say they're breathing at a rate of 40 to 50 times a minute on a ventilator, are you gonna be able to get a good accurate plateau pressure if they're breathing throughout that whole cycle? They don't give you that 0.5 to 1.5 second pause? Probably not. So if it's not considered accurate during active breathing, right? So that's something to look at here. So after breath has been delivered, 0.5 to 1.5 seconds, and we're looking at the recoil of the lungs, the elastance of the lungs. Well, what's the, what's the advantage of looking at the elastance of the lungs? The elastance can tell me if there's a compliance issue or not. Because if I see, I'm looking at the health of the respiratory zone with the plateau pressure, right? That plateau pressure is looking at the health of the respiratory zone. So then I can see, do we have a respiratory zone issue? like a pneumonia that's developing or getting better or getting worse? Or do I have a error resistance issue where the compliance hasn't changed at all? That's gonna be our advantage of checking that plateau pressure. So what if we do see high peak airway pressures? Really high peak airway pressures, I'm like, well, it could be compliance, it could be raw, it could be both. And then I check a plateau pressure. Plateau pressure hasn't changed. That tells me respiratory zone is good, so compliance hasn't changed. But my error resistance is probably gone up. So then it tells me, okay, is this secretions? Is this something else that's going on? Then I can troubleshoot that more efficiently. All right, plateau pressure is often used interchangeably with alveolar pressure uh, and intrapulmonary pressure. So you will see that synonyms uh, out there. Uh, it usually reflects the elastic recoil of the lungs. Remember, elastins is the inverse of compliance, and that's why it tells you about lung compliance, right? So it's elastic recoil on gas on the volume on the inside of the alveoli, right? So we're looking in the ventilator circuit how much recoil there is. The higher the elastic recoil, the lower the compliance, right? Because elastins increases, compliance decreases. So if I see high plateau pressure, that means my compliance is going down. If my plateau pressure is trending down, right, I keep going into the patient uh, every four hours, every uh, two hours, so on and so forth, I keep seeing that patient and I see their plateau pressures keep going down, keep going down, keep going down, that's a sign that their elastance is decreasing, therefore their compliance is increasing, right? So that's where it helps us out quite a bit. So it's a way to look at lung compliance by checking elastins. Remember, they can't be breathing for it to be an accurate value, right? All right, so pressure at the end of exhalation. This is where we start talking about air trapping or auto peep, right? Uh, as previously mentioned, air can be trapped in the lungs during mechanical ventilation if we're not allowed to exhale. We don't have that full five second time constant for exhalation. So the most effective way to prevent this auto peep is to monitor the pressure in the ventilator circuit at the end of exhalation. So we're gonna have what peep we set, what pressure we set, and then we're gonna see what the patient ventilator reading is reading back. Right? So let's say I have the patient set at five centimeters of water pressure, and then I have a reading back of 15. Well, that tells me the patient at the end of exhalation is having a lot higher pressure than what it should be at baseline. That means there's a lot of pressure pent up or built up in their lungs. Well, we need to look at that. That tells me I need to do effective changes to decrease that auto peep, right? So I need to monitor this. So every time we're checking these patients, is there auto peep? Is there peep that's left over uh, or intrinsic peep, right? So if there's no extrinsic peep, if I put them on a peep of zero, right? If there's no extrinsic peep, I have a setting of zero peep and uh, I see a pressure of five, 
at the end of exhalation, then that tells me they have a lot of pressure left over, right? So that tells me I need to do something like uh, decreasing my inspiratory time so I have a longer expiratory time, or I need to consider if they're wheezing, right? If they have obstructive airways, I need to consider doing airway clearance or doing a bronchodilating medicines, things to help stent open their airways uh, and treat that. So when we're looking for auto people, we'll practice different techniques and we'll talk about the advantages and disadvantages of each of those. At baseline, at the end of exhalation, the volume of air remaining in the lungs is at FRC, right? At the end of inhalation, before exhalation starts, the volume in the lungs is at tidal volume plus FRC, right? So we have tidal volume on top of FRC, so we're looking at uh, the only lung volume being left over would be inspiratory reserve volume. So when we're looking at this, the pressure measured at the point which no flow of air is the plateau pressure. So the plateau pressure is pretty much measuring tidal volume plus SR, uh, FRC, sorry, tidal volume plus FRC. And so that's what we're looking at. What's that back pressure of tidal volume plus FRC? So you'll see that figure there, and that's what it's just trying to explain. How much elastance or how much air is trapped over, how much pressure is being exerted in the lung after uh, that breath has been delivered. So here's another picture. This is from your book, and we're looking at PIP versus plateau pressure. So I like this chart a little bit here. So we see it takes a lot more pressure for the ventilator to deliver a breath than for it when the breath has stopped being delivered because now there's no movement of gas. That movement of gas can really change your peak inspiratory pressure, how much pressure it takes to deliver that breath. If I have a, someone with severe bronchospasm, I'm going to have a lot higher peak inspiratory pressures. If I have someone that's morbidly obese and lots of uh, pressure being pushed on their chest, their abdomen and their chest while pushing down on their lungs, restricting it, it's going to take a lot of pressure to deliver that breath to push that adipose tissue out of the way. So I'm going to have a lot of pressure required to deliver that breath, but the amount of pressure left over after that breath has been delivered is usually going to be a lot lower. So that's what we look at PIP versus plateau pressure. The bigger the gradients get, if my PIP keeps going up and my plateau stays the same, that's a raw relationship because they didn't go together. Right? So if my PIP increases and my plateau increases with it, then that's a compliance change, right? And then I'm looking at what's causing their compliance change. If their if their PIPs decrease and their plateaus decrease together, then their compliance is improving. They're getting the lung units are getting healthier, right, with that change and whatever's going on whether it's a ventilator setting or with pathophysiology. So this is where looking at PIP and plateau can help us with compliance versus airway resistance. Remember, it's a raw relationship if PIP goes somewhere and plateau stays home, right? That's a raw relationship. So there's a raw issue going on. So that's something obstructing the airways, right? And then you're looking at obstructive disease patterns. And then if you're looking at plateaus uh, and PIPs going together, they're both moving in the same direction, then that's a compliant relationship. They both go together. They both hold their hands wherever they go. It's a very compliant relationship. And that's going to help uh, you determine, okay, is their compliance improving if they're both uh, decreasing or is their compliance getting worse if they're both increasing? So that would be usually a restrictive process if they're both are going up together like a pneumothorax right your pips and plateaus will be super high together <gasps> okay they're compliant it's cute that they're compliant but it's not cute that both their pips and plateaus are high so this means we need to figure out what's causing their compliance issue right and that's where we look at things like x-rays the patient assessment all that stuff will play a factor into that So just some concept checks here, just to sort of see where you're going. Uh, what is the calculation for a time constant? So the idea here is for you to sort of pause the screen, pause the video, and see if you can answer these from memory. If you can't answer them from memory, great. If you cannot, these are things that you know you need to go back over and make sure you're reviewing to make sure you got these down. All right, so if you've unpaused, let's go ahead and go over these. What is the calculation for time constants? Well, that's compliance times resistance, right? Compliance times resistance. And that will give you one time constant. Remember, you want five of those for 100% tidal volume delivery or five of those for 100% tidal volume to be exhaled. So a time constant approximates the time in seconds 
required to inflate or deflate the lungs, which is perfect because when we usually set inspiratory time or when we usually talk about expiratory time, they're usually in seconds, right? So that's that unit that we want there. So if I want five time constants, that would be where I would go for, um, for their inspiratory time or expiratory time. The calculation of a time constant is important when setting the ventilator's inspiratory time and expiratory time, right? Especially on air-trapping patients like your emphysema, COPD patient population there. We're going to have to look at that expiratory time or even APRV, right? Depending on which APRV method you're using out there. Inspiratory time, especially if you want to get 100% of the tidal volume delivered for adequate ventilation for those, uh, for those patients. There are three basic mechanisms uh, of breathing, and they include, hopefully you got this down, your negative pressure ventilation, right? Uh, your positive pressure ventilation, and then your high frequency. So you have your negative, positive pressure, and high frequency ventilation. So these are three basic things to mimic the mechanisms of breathing. Uh, and they all have their different components, right? So you have a different playbook. If you're more of a chronic long-term home care type situation currently, uh, that's where you could use, in theory, negative pressure ventilation uh, and or positive pressure ventilation. Positive pressure ventilation is usually used with a tracheostomy, an endotracheal tube, and or mask with non-invasive positive pressure ventilation. Uh, and then finally, high-frequency ventilation. The current context as of the recording of this is going to be more in your neonate uh, PD pediatric population uh, traditionally. All right, now some more concept checks. If raw increases, if I have a uh, obstructive disease process and compliance is increased, uh-oh, so I have a big bucket. I have a big bucket and a kinked off hose. What happens to the time constant? Would it increase or decrease? Right, it's gonna be a long time constant because it's a kinked off hose, so gas can't flow through it very well. And I have a big bucket to fill, right? So that's gonna be an example of emphysema. So those are important to, to note when you're taking care of a patient on a ventilator with emphysema, right? They're gonna have a long time constant to get 100% tidal volume delivered and a long time constant to get that breath exhale. Next, if a compliance is decreased, right? So small bucket and the raw is normal, so nothing changed with the hose, what happens to the time it takes to inhale or exhale? So an example of this would be pneumonia. If I have really tiny lung units, or if I have a pleural fusion that's squishing my lungs, I have a tiny lung unit, is it gonna take a long time to fill that really tiny container? No, right, well, is it gonna take a long time to exhale? No, so this would be a short time constant. All right, what happens if raw decreases in a secondary to bronchodilator? and compliance is unchanged. So if raw is decreasing, I give someone that's wheezing in a bronchospasm, a bronchodilating medicine, it's showing improvement in that patient. What happens to that time constant? Is it still gonna be a long time constant or is it gonna change? Of course, it would change, it would become shorter, right? It would decrease that time constant as well. So that's something to be considering of when you do therapeutic interventions that that can impact the time constants, because then you might have to adjust mechanical ventilation based upon their changing pathophysiology. That's part of the reason why we're there.